Welcome back to the Unite Hate podcast, a forum to discuss and combat student hate. Today we are here with Marlene Scott, a retired teacher whose passion project is creating an ethnic studies resource for students and teachers. So hi Marlene, I did not do you justice with that introduction. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and about this amazing project. Thank you, Michi. Glad to be here. I'm a second generation Filipino American born and raised in San Diego. My parents immigrated to the US after World War II because my father fought alongside the US Navy uh, military. Uh, So there was a joint US military agreement where Filipinos and Americans fought together. So he was able to uh, move and bring, uh, move to the United States after the war. Um, In high school, I was an organizer school-wide for the first Earth Day in 1970. And I organized the Martin Luther King Day and Vietnam protests. (laughs) In my 30s and in my 20s after college, I was a community activist focusing on organizing for civil and equal rights uh, for women and people of color. In my 30s and 40s, I became an entrepreneur. I started a business with my husband and it was bought out and uh, we uh, joined a $14 billion company and they made me a corporate president of one of their divisions, which made me the first woman and person of color in the boardroom. Wow. $25 million company. And then I felt like I needed to give back to the community with (laughs) all my experience. So when I turned 50, 50 and got my black belt in Shotokan karate. <laughs> I became a public school educator teaching kindergarten to eighth, which includes a supplementary credential in reading and history. So I hold a US history degree from UCSD and a master's degree in literacy education from Cal State Uni- University, San Marcos. Wow. Okay. So it sounds like you've always had an interest in social justice and getting people involved with a cause. So uh, what led you to create this ethnic studies resource specifically? Well, I wish my teachers from elementary to the college level had used and offered this resource to me. I I went to UCSD, that eight-story space size uh, library. I combed every floor to find anything. And wow. I just found one book on the role of Filipino farm workers in California. That of wow. all those millions of texts, I, I could b- barely find anything. So I, I had so many questions about what caused discrimination and equity in our society. So, and then as I, when I taught K-8 for 18 years as a multiple subject educator, mm-hmm. uh, this resource that I made today would have added more depth and clarity to my lessons at every grade level, as well as all the different subjects. So you can connect the studies across all the subject areas for math, science, not just history. Uh, my first two years at UCSD, I was required to take six courses in humanities, which is the study of history, literature, and philosophy. Mm-hmm. Throughout this period, the only books we read and discussed and we reflected only the viewpoint of white European males. <laughs> Not oh. my books were written by anyone else mm-hmm. for two years. <laughs> uh, so during this time at UCSD, I also, a, a pivotal changing point in my life was uh, being part of the educational opportunity where we recruited poorly resourced high school students of color who wanted to go to college but were denied basic opportunities uh, for their education, such as a Mexican student in San Ysidro was labeled labeled retarded because he spoke Spanish. Oh my gosh. I know. When we went to Los Angeles, a predominantly black high school, the walls were like, it was like bombed out Berlin. They're huge. They had to go to classes with huge openings on the walls of their classroom. And then the most aggravating one was when I went to Paula Reservation in our county. Mm -hmm. Uh, One side was no water running, all dirt and brown, and the other side was green grass uh, watered by for and for the the spas down. And the Native American students 
had to live like that across the street from these rich spas and they had no running water. And I had learned that they had, many of them were separated from the parents to go to boarding schools that Americanized them. So it, it was a light bulb. It was a, an awakening that I, I, I questioned, is this the America that I was taught? So those, mm -hmm. those, those things, that, that's what led me <laughs> to, uh, that, that history led me. And oh, one more thing, fortunately, in my, uh, my junior and senior year at UCSD, they opened up Third College, which is today called Third Good Marshall. Mm -hmm. This focus is to prepare students to develop a deep analysis of the diversity of lived experience in the United States. The institutions oh. and movements through which justice has been advanced and the culture, music, art, literature, and science to which people represent and comprehend US society and the world. So my last two years at UCSD were the most enlightening yeah. due to the diversity of the student and faculty and my activities. I actually had a, a, a saying, don't let your academics get in the way of your education. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most profound things I did in my life was help found the UCSD Asian American Student Alliance, which is still active today. It's almost 50 years old. And they're called the Asian yeah. Pacific yeah. Student Alliance. I they also developed the Council of Filipino American yeah. Organizations that united Fil Filipinos throughout San Diego. And um, I also uh, participated in educating the community about the Marcos regime and the need mm -hmm. to restore civil liberties in the Philippines, among other initiatives of student activities. Oh, wow. Okay. So it sounds like there's not only like uh, a gap for ethnic studies, but rather like a genuine need for students, uh, students of color to understand where they came from and what's going on in America. And then also other students to be educated about all of these different backgrounds, because an education that comes from such a limited perspective, it doesn't, I mean, it's, it's just that limited. So um, given that like this need for ethnic studies, what goal do you expect to accomplish in showing this to students or teachers? As a retired teacher and lifelong learner, I know it is how difficult it is for teachers to design, pace, and teach all the required curriculum standards. Mm -hmm. um, everyone always says, I can't get through all of them in the year, you know, I'm <laughs> barely hitting this part. But by giving students and teachers this resource in the form of a timeline, they can easily pick out and supplement for their lessons key historical individuals, events, struggles, and contributions of people of color and their communities to add depth and complexities to their class discussions. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And given how, given that this curriculum had to be designed for teachers to use throughout the school year and how that's sometimes limiting, what was the research process like? And what was it like to put this together, especially with your perspective as a retired teacher? A great opportunity occurred um, in January of 2022, my former district where I worked, the Oceanside Unified School District, had their superintendent of sec secondary curriculum put out a call to the community asking for volunteers to participate in their ethnic studies advisory group. I said, fantastic, what an opportunity. So I went to meetings, um, we saw some draft model curriculums and I soon realized that one of the things uh, that I could offer and support with is a resource, not they're writing the curriculum. I just want to assist in mm -hmm. an additional resource that I wish I had so that yeah. is so they can scan history and contributions of all Americans, particularly the four foundational groups, indigenous peoples, African Americans, Latinx, Chick Chicken Chick Chicanx, and Asian Americans. The ethnic studies student teacher resource. I call timelines of American history was created because it, it, it's just a nice, simple guide that um, includes also links to the California Department of Educational Model Curriculum, which I think it has 686 pages 
of really great ideas already for teachers. They don't even have to start from scratch if they want to. I, I've looked at most of those lessons and they're written. They're so fantastic. So th there's a link there for that. Uh, mm -hmm. um, a glossary. I have elements of a University of California approved course, and I know you may be interested in making sure your ethnic studies is UC approved. Yeah. And then a chapter on ethnic studies, purpose, and history. I added one more chapter on immigration and other recommended resources. So it's currently at 124 pages and growing daily as my research expands. And I chose a PDF format so that students and teachers can just upload the resource. I can just email it to them. They can upload it. Yeah. And without any cost or publishing or printing copies, costs, um, it just makes it so easily accessible. It's on your laptop. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay, so um, this ethnic study stuff, it sounds like it was somewhat based off of the current curriculum or uh, was that used as a foundation in any way? Um, the current curriculum of the, you mean in U.S. history and this? Yeah, of U.S. history, because it sounds like that's uh, your main, like, concentration slash focus, or was it based off of any kind of uh, standards in California, or was it more of an independent resource? Uh, for what I wrote, um, I I looked at the tech, I taught U.S. history um, in yeah. school, so I have I kept my U.S. history textbooks and I would like count how many paragraphs covered Asian Americans. <laughs> I mean, I, oh, I, yeah, like barely, say page, I couldn't even say pages, you know, and yeah, this huge textbook. And so basically I wanted to include only those entries that you don't find in the U.S. history book. So mm. if you already have it in your U.S. history book it's not going to be in my resource because it's in every history, U.S. history. Yeah. So that, that makes sense. drove me to de define what I'm going to write. Oh, I see. Okay. So it's less about what the curriculum currently has and more about offering like a different perspective or a, an undercovered perspective. It, yeah. Un, un, undiscussed, un, unwritten in our textbook, left out, you know, <laughs> and it's time to expand our understanding. We we're not just Europeans, <laughs> Americans. We're yeah. the births and the the voices, the stories, the contributions have to be reflected of our our nation. Yeah, I I I agree. It's completely, I guess, uh, like the ethos of America, like the melting pot of the world, and it's not very uh, representative of the people in America if we're only learning from you know white men. So, because, you know, we're not a country of white men. We, so, we would end up not being a country anymore because we, we wouldn't have any next generations of us all white. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So why okay, don't so, we leave everyone out? <laughs> we built America. <laughs> the rest of us helped build America. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So more on the background of this, I found it really interesting when you mentioned the experiences and the things that you saw and the inequities that you noticed that led you to create this resource. So around when did you create this resource? And if you remember, what was going on in like the country or around you at the time that maybe inspired you to do so? Well, it was last year, 2022. It was after George Floyd. I mean, I'm 71 years old. I've 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 been trying to learn about ethnic studies since I was in high school. So mm -hmm. throughout my life, I've seen many scenarios where I wish we could talk about this in schools and find understand each other more to build a better world. So, yeah. OK, so was it so was it more of a need that you noticed throughout your entire life from high school to adulthood uh, to retirement? Uh, rather than something that was like sudden? Oh, yeah, it wasn't anything sudden. <laughs> it's been <laughs> a goal of mine for 50, 50 plus years. Yeah, that makes because, sense. So you can imagine how ecstatic I was when <laughs> Gavin Newsom, our governor, signed the bill to require ethnic studies in our high school by 2029, 2030 school year. I mean, they need to get started now, but, you know, you can't graduate unless you have ethnic studies in your um, transcript. 
Yeah, that's really important. And for students today, do you, um, as a teacher, did you also see like this need or desire to learn more about ethnic studies in the students that you taught? Oh, absolutely. I, I did my utmost best because I chose Oceanside Unified because it's the most diverse district in North County. It had every nationality and the, pretty much the proportion of the nation. And I, so it was a beautiful uh, collection of all uh, students of different cultures and ethnicities and backgrounds. So when I uh, taught it, taught anything, when we, we, I always tried to include that, okay, if it was a story about uh, uh, primarily a, a white scientist, I would also include what, there are other scientists that not yeah. all scientists are white, or the, there are these women who are also in space, or these. Mm -hmm. you know, so I always try to make it multicultural so all kids can see themselves represented in history to encourage mm -hmm. them that they can be whatever they want to be. Yeah, that's really important, especially about representation, because a lot of the things that hold kids back nowadays isn't other uh, like restrictions that they have, like financial, but sometimes it's all in their head. Like they don't see people like them represented in their field. I know a lot of girls my age who are scared to go into STEM just because of the high concentrations of men. Uh, so this need is very important for students. Do you think that teachers also have that need or is their need for ethnic studies something different? Well, I think most teachers who teach their students want to have a more comprehensive, comprehensive understanding of, of history, science, math, and the contributions of all people. Even though mm -hmm. they're like in San Diego Unified, it's a heavily white upper middle class community. Those yeah. teachers still want because ethnic studies is for all students because it represents the history of their, of all students, black and white, people of color, um, Spanish speakers. It, our history, we need to work together to make our country better. And we need mm -hmm. to learn together. We need to learn how to collaborate and uh, be, you know, in all areas of public or private life uh, to, because that's what's gonna make a stronger America. Definitely. Do you think that knowing all facets of our history, all of the perspectives and all of the different kinds of people of different backgrounds that helped make America how it is today, do you think that knowing all of that new information would help increase student engagement in history and the humanities and all classes in general? Well, there is a Stanford University uh, Graduate School of Education research that revealed that ethnic studies motivated students who hadn't shown prior success in school. Wow. Students who took ethnic studies courses in ninth grade, this motivation lasted through high school, resulting in higher attendance, higher graduation rates, and increased enrollment in college compared to a similarly matched group of students who didn't take the course. So uh, we can't not see the, the this research. Ethnic studies helps all students, and particularly wow. those who feel like school doesn't matter to them or care about them. That's really impressive. I didn't know that. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, every day you learn something new. But uh, given the positive effects of engaging with ethnic studies or participating in ethnic studies course, do you think that there's any negative effects of opting out of ethnic studies or not having that option available to students? Well, the negative effect is long term. Students will never learn that we all contributed to America and the contributions that others have made can be lessons that they can draw from to drive their, their growth in their own disciplines or in their world of uh, interests. So yes, if it's just like saying, um, leaving out, a, when I go to school, we, we can only do reading, writing, listening, speaking, let's leave out science and math and social studies. I mean, why would we wanna leave those out? That would make us a fuller scholar to have a broad spectrum of understanding of reality. <laughs> yeah. 
Do you think that having this broad spectrum of understanding and more education about, you know, the background of certain things or how uh, like even marginalized groups have contributed to how America is today? Do you think that that could help reduce uh, like prejudice and hate among students? Well, um, I'm really hopeful um, because I really think ethnic studies is really going to help this the younger generation of um, adults, young young people in high school and college today, they are much more informed than my generation. They're mm -hmm. much more exposed to different cultures and ideas than my generation. I mean, my generation had country music, soul, and pop. <laughs> now, <laughs> you think of all the massive genres just on specify, mm -hmm. Spotify. So yeah. this generation, uh, when I was in high school, no one talked about systemic racism or mm -hmm. even came out openly gay if they were LGBT. Now students are, they, they know, they, they're exposed. They have, uh, and I, but I did have a high school teacher who taught black studies. So she, she really mm -hmm. was an inspiration. But I think it's really important that those who spread hate and fear are well organized, which means we all must engage in fighting for the truth in our history and stop banning books. Uh, we need to trust wow. and allow teachers who know their students' strengths and challenges to design their daily curriculum to meet their classroom needs. We're losing a lot of teachers at a record mm -hmm. rate, and that's because they don't feel, they feel threatened. And it's just a small minority. I, I heard like, 2,000 books were banned by a group of only 11 women, something oh like that. Oh, my gosh. So it's a small vocal group that's well organized, and we can't let them bring us down. The, the, the history's on our side. We need to activate and really move and do, because most people understand that there's uh, systemic racism, and they, they, yeah. they believe we need to do something about it, and it starts with education. That definitely makes sense. I really like how you frame it as not just ethnic studies, but rather also advocating for the truth, because you're completely right. It is the truth that offers a fuller perspective to students. And given how open this generation is, Generation Z and the younger people, it's kind of upsetting that they aren't able to learn it right now or that it's not available to them. So what other factors besides like banning books and discouraging teachers from teaching these kinds of things are preventing the widespread adoption of ethnic studies? Well, um, I think I think I, most people see it in for. What your question again was, what's preventing ethnic studies? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I think there is a fear factor. The the vocal minority are creating fear among the the vast majority of Americans who support ethnic studies and support learning the real history of America and finding ways to end systemic racism. We don't want at George Floyd to they don't they ever since George Floyd many people um I I'm looking looking for my numbers but in recent years the number of white Americans who think that racial discrimination is a big problem has soared in polling oh. from barely over 50 percent in 2015 to over 70 percent Wow. Now, 90% agree that racism and police violence are problems in America. Majorities across all racial groups express support for the Black Lives Matter movement and peaceful protests of George Floyd's murder. The bottom line, according to the Brookings report, it concluded that, quote, it's not 1968 anymore. A large share of white Americans now endorse views on race relations once, once confined largely to African Americans, unquote. That's why I feel teachers and students and our greater community will be open to this resource and will support this. And they have no choice, it's law. There's yeah. those who say, we're gonna go to the governor and stop this. I go, it's already been signed into law, <laughs> part of the, uh, graduation requirements. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if they do a, a referendum or whatever, they they will find that it's not going to 
get traction. The, mm -hmm. I think the direction is towards it. It's just that in this initial phase, uh, we just got to be brave and push forward. Yeah, I actually I was really surprised when you read those statistics about white Americans who believe that like racial discrimination is an issue because just like like you said, the vocal minority has been so vocal. I just in my head, I thought that fewer people would be, um, you know, in favor of having these things be big issues, uh, less willing to accept that they are big issues, stuff like that. So um, overall, if this resource, if slash when this resource is implemented, uh, do you think students and teachers will be open, like in general? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, they want to do it. They're already starting to do it. And, mm -hmm. and throughout California, there's at least 48 districts, uh, school districts that are already implementing ethnic studies. It's unfortunate that San Diego Unified is one of the uh Lower and even North County yeah. or Oceanside. So we have a lot, the community and the teachers and the students, uh, and we need to we need to push forward. And I'm looking forward to our new uh, superintendent, Dr. Steffieri, and hopefully that she's going to uh, ignite the motion towards getting this done and uh, designing the curriculum and supporting it and getting everyone on board. Yeah, definitely. I really hope that happens as well. Why do you think San Diego and Oceanside and this general area has been slow to adopt ethnic studies? Um, I think they get it. Uh, it's it, they fall in their. It's either they're intimidated and fearful mm -hmm. of, of what could happen to their jobs. Yeah, or they don't want controversy, and they. I'm change requires courage, mm -hmm. <laughs> bravery, and leadership, and commitment. It's just not going to happen. You got to get get out there and fight for it. And we need more people like you, Mitchie, and other students and teachers to just stand up and make it happen. Yeah. So, how does uh, student support help the widespread adoption of ethnic studies? Well, students, along with their parents and teachers, uh, must understand that opposition, the opposition wants us to fear the future and fear each other. Mm -hmm. It's time to change our story to one that is more inclusive and egalitarian, that benefits the whole community, where everyone has a voice in the political process. Accumulating wealth, power, and privilege at the expense of the health and welfare of the greater good is not sustainable. Yeah. We want student scholars who are critical thinkers, creative and innovative, collaborative and great communicators for a more just, equitable, peaceful, sustainable and democratic world. So uh, I know they're out there. We just need to ignite them. Yeah. Definitely. And you mentioned one of the biggest barriers to widespread adoption of what sounds like a wholly beneficial curriculum is this fear, whether it's fear from people at the top or adults for losing their job or being too controversial or fear for student from students for speaking out in something they believe in. Do you think that this fear will go away once ethnic studies is implemented? The more we we make progress in ethnic studies and everyone realizes it's not the big uh, scary <laughs> monster it is. <laughs> it, it really is enlightening our minds to what happened in history and how we can not make the same mistakes again. And that's a positive thing. And mm -hmm. that there, there will be hopefully the end goal is less um, discrimination, inequity, more fairness in, in the workplace, and more policies that promote the welfare of our country as a whole, and not a small minority who have privilege and power. Definitely. It sounds like ethnic studies is going to lead to a lot of really beneficial changes, especially for minorities or people who've, you know, consistently been marginalized in the U.S. How when, is- uh, when people who are marginalized, can contribute equally 
without mm -hmm. discrimination. It's going to help white people because the boardroom discussions, the workplace discussions, the scientific discussions, mathematical uh, literature will be even more enriched because more people wow. are allowed to participate and be listened yeah. to and heard. And uh, they're going to be enlightened and see, oh, wow, I didn't realize I could design this uh, this way. And if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have had that big change that can make a difference in our scientific knowledge you know when you leave out people's voice you leave out knowledge and opportunity for growth for all all of mankind no i completely agree i something that one of my friends aaron actually told me uh like a year ago was that diversity like biodiversity is critical in nature to keep ecosystems alive it so works. why can't we yeah why can't we apply that to other environments like you I know love Congress, that analogy. boardrooms yeah exactly so exactly. diversity is yeah, diversity is so incredibly important. And um, so it sounds like it's going to lead to a lot of great changes, not just for marginalized communities, but also, you know, for white people, because it enhances discussions, all of that leads to innovation. So how are students and teachers going to carry what they learned or what they took away from ethnic studies to all of these really meaningful changes? I think, like we said, um, when you enter a, a, a e either a, a nonprofit or a profitable organization or any type of a group group situation even if, if you're assigned in antarctica you still have to work with a group of individuals the more you're open and learn that everyone can contribute to the process to the learning to the growth of whatever your your goal is it's just going to make it richer when you cut out ideas voices contributions, you're limiting yourself. And um, so we're trying to help people understand that anything that uh, keeps people out of an opportunity to get a college education or an investment, a job, just because of the color of their skin, mm -hmm. that's hurting us all. Yeah. That's a really, that's a great perspective to adopt because I feel like a lot of students and even adults today don't like fully understand that con concept, that more diversity and having, you know, a more diverse workforce and more people surrounded, uh, surrounding you is actually a good thing and not a cause for, you know, more competition or to be more fierce towards those newcomers. So this sounds like a really great project and something that all students should have a role in or get involved in. So how can any listeners get involved, not just in San Diego, Diego, but even in their own districts for advocating for ethnic studies? Well, I think um, listeners can support their local, county, state, and national struggles by speaking up at school board meetings, asking teachers what books and resources they need and donate them, talk to their children about what's happening with ethnic studies in their school, write editorials in their local newspapers, and hold book study groups on the subject of ethnic studies. And one book I'm really into right now is The Nation That Never Was, Reconstructing America, America's Story by Kermit Roosevelt III. So if you have a chance, it's it's available in, uh, in your uh, local bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Okay. And um, overall, thank you so much for uh, your time and for being here and for helping our letting our listeners know about this great resource. Uh, and I think we should be good. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michi.